All right, Cascade Hills, you ought to be excited today. I'm excited for you. My good friend Scott Dawson is in the house today to bring the word. And uh, I love this man. This man is a blessing to me. He's got a calling on his life. Um, anytime he's around, we see people come to know God. Um, he fills stadiums, baseball stadiums, and sees tons of people give their life to God. And uh, we are blessed to have Scott here today. And so would you do me a favor and give Scott Dawson a warm Cascade Hills welcome. Good morning, church. My goodness gracious, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Would you do me a favor? Could we just appreciate your praise and worship team that has led us this morning? My goodness, they, Clint, Pastor Clint and, and the entire team, they have given it everything they have, all four services. And I'll just say this for your entire staff. Uh, I just appreciate them so much. Uh, There's so many of them that are doing their job, staying in their lane, pursuing godliness and pursuing excellence. And I just, it, it is so refreshing to me to see a staff that's just rallied around one cause. And I know what, how that happens. It happens because you have an incredible pastor with Pastor Brent, Miss Carrie. Can we just give the, the, the Lord an offering of praise for them? We honor them. We hope they get some rest. And we know how that happens. It's because y'all had the original, y'all had the OG pastor Bill and Miss Debbie, didn't you? I mean, my goodness, we love them. I, I have just fallen in love with your church. I've almost joined three times now. I've had to go. I don't live here, but I, I just love this place because we're gathered in the house this morning for one reason, and that's because the tomb is empty, the throne is occupied, and Jesus Christ is Lord. So uh, I am, I am, I, I've been so pumped. Uh, in fact, I, I told one of the services, I was like, you know, I was preaching, and in my mind, I was having this conversation with myself about 10 minutes into the message, the first message. I was like, calm down, Dawson. I mean, you're just, you're, you're bringing it uh, so hard and heavy. Here's the reason why. I'm a full-time evangelist, okay? My, my calling, my job is to get as many people as humanly possible under one roof at one particular time, and the pandemic hit. I had 51 events that either canceled or has to be, had to be postponed. I was over on the sidelines for 14 months. All this energy has just been pent up. I'm coming with both barrels loaded this morning, okay? Because I, I've had to literally, hey, I, I, we can give the Lord praise offering on that too. Uh, I, I have been studying and thinking what's going to happen when we get out of this thing. And if, if I hear people say, I can't wait for things to go back to normal, I don't know about you. I don't want to go through the last 14 months and go back to something normal. I want a new normal. I want a new beginning, a new opportunity. And so the message this morning is basically the post-pandemic follower of Christ. What is that going to look like? Because, you know, we've got to start getting adjusted and, get, and launching out to what's in our future. And the way I'm going to introduce it is by the Apostle Paul. Now, most of us know Paul was first referred to as Saul, Saul of Tarsus. And if you study Scripture, you find that Saul of Tarsus was uh, anti-church, anti-Christian. He, he was a bad man. You didn't want to mess with him. If you read Acts chapter 6 and 7, you find the young man Stephen, the first martyr of our faith. Uh, the, Saul of Tarsus was the one who commissioned his death. So you, you didn't mess with this man named Saul. And he was on the road to Damascus to go and persecute more Christians. And on the road to Damascus, something happened to him. He met Jesus. He didn't find someone who knew Jesus. He didn't get some more information about Jesus. He met Jesus. And when Jesus entered into his life, Jesus became so much more than just an addition to his life. Jesus became the transformation of his life. And all of a sudden, Saul of Tarsus, he couldn't even go on being called Saul anymore. You see Scripture starting to transfer, uh, transfer his name to Paul. He is later called Paul the Apostle. And Paul was the greatest missionary the world's ever seen. He, he, he would go into an area, and at that time, God would use him to birth the church. And he was in a place called Galatia. Now, when you go to Galatia, you need to realize this is a hustling, bustling city. 
And as Paul got there, the, the word of the Lord was received, the church was birthed, and, and people were, were growing in the Lord. Well, Paul, with his missionary mindset, the evangelist about him, he carried on in his journey. Well, as soon as Paul left, another group came in called the Judaizers. Now, when the Judaizers came in, they, they were simply someone that were, they were causing confusion in the church because they were saying, not only do you have to have Jesus, Paul was right in that, but you got to have something more. You got to go through this ritual. And they were talking about something called circumcision in order to get right with the Lord. Well, as soon as the Apostle Paul got wind of what was going on in Galatia and the confusion that was abounding, that's when Paul penned the book of Galatians. And if you know, Paul wrote the majority of the books of the New Testament. And most of the time, the way he, um, he wrote the books, it was through dictation. He would speak it and someone would transcribe it. But if you read the book of Galatians, you see Paul in, in, in that book says, don't you see what large book I have written in my own handwriting? So it's so passionate of Paul that he is going, you've got to understand this cannot go on. And the entire book of Galatians is Paul going, hey, the work of Jesus is enough. It is Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. So when he gets to the end of the book of Galatians, he's gone through a tough time. He is trying to bring not only reconciliation, but to launch them into the future. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 17, that's what I want you to look down on, and that's going to be our launching pad this morning. Listen to what he says, and this is from the New King James Version. He says, from now on, let no one cause me trouble. Basically, case closed. We've refuted this. It is Jesus plus nothing that equals salvation. But then the next phrase, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. That, the word marks there is the one that we're going to use because it is the word in the original language, stigmata. Now, basically what that means, it is something more than just chevron stripes on a uniformed soldier. It is if you were to go to a cattle farmer and ask them to show you how they brand their cattle, that is the intensity, that is the, the, the meaning of this word, marks. Paul is saying, I've basically been branded with Jesus. And if we're going to walk out of here, if we're going to launch into this next decade of ministry, what are going to be the marks on our life if we're going to be an effective follower of Jesus Christ? I believe if you were to keep your Bible open to Galatians chapter 6, we're going to walk through this chapter and find four marks we've got to have in our life. The first mark is found in verse 1 of Galatians chapter 6. I call it the mark of being spiritual or the mark of spirituality. Now, this is a word that is used in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Listen to what Paul says here. He says, brothers. Now, when he uses the word brothers, that would be like me looking at you today and going, hey, guys. It means everyone. It is not just gender. It's for everyone. Okay? He says, if anyone is caught in transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. If you have a pen or a pencil and you have a Bible open, I want you to circle that word spiritual. The reason why I want you to do that is because I want you to remember that that is a scriptural term. Because nowadays, we don't really know what the term spiritual means. If I were to ask you, are you a spiritual person, you would go, or, is that something that Dr. Oz talks about? Is that something that Ellen discusses? What does the term spiritual mean? In, in fact, it, it is really one of three conditions that every one of us is in before God. Do, do you know every one of us is in one of three conditions before God? You can't be in two. You can't be exempt. Every one of us is in one of three conditions. The first condition Scripture talks about is a natural person, a natural man, a natural woman. That is um, someone who's in this room that you <laughs> or watching online that you have been birthed on this planet. And you, I know you're sitting there going, well, that's pretty elementary. Well, let me, under, let me explain to you that there's some conditions there. It also means a natural person is someone who's been birthed on a fallen planet, a fallen creation. That simply means that we've all got one thing in common. 
We don't like to discuss it. We don't like to admit it. But the fact of the matter is, every one of us has got one thing in common. I live in Alabama. You may live in Georgia. We've got one thing in common. You know what that is? We've all done something wrong. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. If you don't believe me, I'm going to ask you a question. If you've ever told a lie in your entire life, not just today, it's still early, okay? But if you've ever told a lie in your entire life or lies, I, I just want you, would you just raise your hand right now? Just raise, keep it up, keep it up, keep it up, keep it up. With your hand in the air, I want you to look around this room right now. Do you see all the liars who came to church at 11 a.m.? And if you didn't raise your hand, there's nothing I can do for you, okay? I mean, it, 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 we're all sinners. I mean, the Bible is true when it says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is, there is something about this. And the reason why I, I exp illustrate it is because I want some of you to realize that you're not the only one who's messed up. Some of you have walked in this room or you're watching online and you think you're the only one that's ever messed up. You're the only one who's ever blown it. We've all messed up. We've all blown it. We've all chosen to sin against God. And the problem with that is that we've separated ourselves from the holiness of God. How did this take place? You have to go back to the Garden of Eden. And it's in the Garden of Eden where we realize where sin was first created or, or, or in, intervened in our creation. The woman, Eve, was deceived, but the man, Adam, standing right beside her, deliberately disobeyed. And from that moment, sin has entered the hearts and in the, flows through the veins of every man, every woman, every boy, every girl. We're sinners before a holy God. The reason why I emphasize holiness is because holiness is absolute perfection. I love to preach about the love of God. I love to preach about the forgiveness of God. But I challenge you to read your Bible. You'll never read where it says three times he is loving, loving, loving. You'll never read where it says three times he's forgiving, forgiving, forgiving. But you know what you will read? He is holy, holy, holy. You, you can't sidestep that. You can't treat the attributes of God like it's some buffet. And you go, I want his grace and I want his mercy and that holiness. Eh, no, don't want that. You can't, understand, you can't do it like that. Because of the holiness of God, I'm separated from him. You are separated from him. And you can't blame Adam for this. You can't blame your family for this. You can't blame society for this. We have all chosen to rebel against God. But here's the gospel story. When we couldn't come to him, he came to us. Jesus came on this planet, and for 33 years he walked among us, and he never once says in his word, pay me. He doesn't even say, thank me. You know what his call is? Follow me. Because he knew his mission on this planet. He went to the cross. And when he died on the cross, he did something for me I could not do for myself. He did something for you you could not do for yourself. The Bible says it like this. But God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. That we might be made the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. And when I was growing up, they'd always called Jesus the God-man. And I think that was so cool. And they describe it like this. He is all God like he is no man. He is all man like he is no God. And that sounds really f interesting, but you'll never understand it until you put him on the cross. Because it is on the cross we discover because Jesus is all God. He is firmly grasped to God's deity. But because he's all man, at that point he could reach out to the sinfulness of mankind. And when they lifted Jesus Christ up, he became the one who bridged the gap between God and man together again. That's the reason there's hope. So if you're here this morning or watching online and you do not have a personal relationship with Christ, I'm not saying you're a bad person. I'm not saying you're an immoral person. I am saying the Bible calls you a natural person. That means you're on this planet apart from the living God. Now, then there's the second condition. The second condition Paul uses is in the book of Romans. That's when he uses the term a carnal man, a carnal woman, a carnal person. Now, how in the world am I going to define to you in a short amount of time, what does it mean to be a, a carnal person? Well, have y'all ever um, seen 
the, uh, an international movie that's been dubbed in English, maybe late at night and you have nothing else to do and you watch those. Is that not just one of the most weird things? The mouths are moving, nothing's coming out, it's not synced. That, that's what I believe a carnal person is. It is when their audio is not matched with their video. A carnal person is someone who's in the southern culture, the buckle of the Bible belt. I'm just going to put it to you. It's the person who says, I know Jesus but then they live like they really don't. Their audio is not matched with their video. Here's what Jesus says about it. He says, with their lips they praise me, but their hearts are far away. So that's the, that's the natural person, the carnal person. And then Paul says, Galatians 6, 1, if a, per, a, a spiritual person, if I were to ask this crowd or online audience who is spiritual, we would go, man, I, I, I know Jesus, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't refer to myself as a spiritual person. Well, you know who the, the spiritual person is the person who knows Jesus. And you may be sitting there going, but I'm not perfect. I get that. But you are in a relationship with Jesus. And you know what that means? You're being molded into the image of Christ. If you're in a relationship with Christ, that means I should be more like Jesus today than I was three years ago when I was here. I'll be more like Jesus next time than I am today. I'm growing. I'm being molded into his image. And if you're sitting here and you're bound by your past, you're sitting here going, but you don't know what all I've done, let me give you a refreshing word. When you come to know Jesus personally, you know what he does? He presents us pure and blameless before God the Father. God the Father looks at us through the blood of Jesus Christ. That means if you're in this room or you're watching this, this service, if you know Jesus, you are perfect in your Father's eyes. So that's the spiritual person. You may be sitting here and you're going, you have totally confused me. I don't know if I'm a natural person. I don't know if I'm a carnal person. I don't know if I'm a spiritual person. Here's the question. Has Jesus changed your life? If Jesus has changed your life, you're right over here in the spirit. You see, you may meet a religious figure and forget about it. You may go through a religious ritual and get over it. But you don't meet Jesus and get over him. In, in fact, there's a Russian proverb. It's about 150 years of age. I, I want to bring it up on the screen. I want you to listen to this, this proverb. It says, those who have been infected with the disease of Jesus will never be cured. You take that through the pandemic, amen? I mean, you, you, all the stuff we've walked through. Listen to what the Russian proverb says a century ago. Those who have been infected with the disease of Jesus, you don't get over him. There's no cure for Jesus. He infects our entire life. And there's so much talk about vaccinations. And I, I'm not going to ask. Let me just go pre-pandemic, okay? I was going, on a, going to go on a mission trip, and, and they told me I had to get a vaccination because what they told me I could catch, <laughs> I was going to get vaccinated, okay? So I, I went to my doctor. He's a family friend. He was going to give me a shot. And I wish I could say I planned it, but it was simply right off the cuff. He was about to give me a shot, and I stopped him. And I said, hey, Bert. What are you about to do to me? And I'll never forget what happened. He stopped, he tilted his head back, and he started laughing. And he said, well, Scott, to be honest with you, I'm about to give you the disease. But he said, don't worry, I'm just going to give you enough of it so your body can build a defense against it, and you'll never become infected. And at that moment, it galvanized in my mind. If you're not careful, you know what happens? In the southern culture, You'll get just enough Jesus in your system that you'll not become infected by him. You'll just get enough of him in your system that you're vaccinated against him. That you'll still come to the services. You'll watch it online because, let's face it, these folks are talented up here. They've been giving it all weekend. That song, he is for us. The blessing, I mean, that is a great song. You'll even listen to the message as long as it's not too long and there's a couple of jokes, okay? And you're sitting there going, man, I don't know if I'm natural. I don't know if I'm carnal. I don't know if I'm spiritual. Here's the question. Has Jesus changed your life? Because that's going to have to be a mark in your life. You're going to have to really understand it's not enough just to be vaccinated. You've got to be infected with Jesus to be effective. Now, as I walked up on the platform, I walked up over here on the steps. So I want you to see that these marks build on one another. The foundational step is being that of godly or being spiritual in our lives. But if we're going to be an effective follower of Christ, there's some other marks that are going to have to be there. 
The second one is found down in verse 3 of Galatians chapter 6. They're going to bring it up on the screen. It's the mark of humility. Listen to what Paul says in verse 3. He says, For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Now, you've got to remember that Paul is refuting any type of addition to the work of Christ. He's referring back to when he, when he writes in Ephesians chapter 2, For by grace are you saved through faith. It is the gift of God. You can't boast about it. It wasn't anything you did. But how does this mean to us in 2021? I, I believe Paul is saying for a post-pandemic follower of Christ, there's going to be the mark of humility in our lives. We're not going to walk around filled with pride and filled with uh, devastating attributes because uh, we've heard all of our life, pride comes before what? A fall. Now, you know where we get that. That's Proverbs 16, 18. But you know what the verse says? The verse says a haughty spirit comes before a fall. Now, a haughty spirit, if you study that phrase, it really just means um, that, that you need to be brought back into the scope of reality. It's not necessarily pride. It's just a warped view of yourself. We've all been there. Every one of us has had a haughty spirit. In fact, one, one of my favorite stories is the story about Muhammad Ali, you know, the greatest boxer to have ever lived. The story goes after the thriller in Manila. He got on the plane. He had the heavyweight championship belt on. He was parading around. The stewardess came up and said, sir, please sit down. Put your seatbelt on. We're about to take off. To which Muhammad Ali kind of quipped, Superman doesn't need a seatbelt. To which the students replied, Superman doesn't need an airplane. Okay, sit down, put your seatbelt, we're about to take off. So you, you gotta, that's a warped view that had to be brought into reality. That's a haughty spirit. Pride, Scripture says, comes before destruction. Now, what is pride? Pride, by definition, is a self-sustaining spirit. Let me share with you, pride is when you're to the point where you're bent on doing it yourself. You're, you're, you're closed to any type of advice, any sort of godly counsel. You're bent on doing it your own way. And there's two forms of pride. There's one, arrogance. That's just outlandish. That is the one. We've all seen that. They walk into the room, you go, oh my goodness, they're full of themselves. That, that, that's easily uh, noticed and easily and, and quickly condemned. But in church life, I'm even going to go one step further, in ministry, you know what I've realized? There's another form of pride. Sometimes it's overlooked. And it's one of those that it's, um, it's, it's kind of subtle. It's not arrogance, but it's just as deadly. It's false humility. I mean, it, it is when I know how to turn the phrases and get the situation to where I, I, I will smile, I will be complicit but the, I'm still bent on doing it my own way. That's what scares me about sometimes in church culture when I'm dealing with teenagers. They'll, they'll look and they know the answers and they'll smile, but down deep inside, they're bent on doing it their own way. They're complicit, but God's never called us to be complicit. God's called us to be obedient. Now, I, I, it's basically you're humble and proud of it, if I were to bring it like that. But here, here's the way I would illustrate it, okay? Uh, there's a movie out called Courageous. Has anybody seen Courageous? Anybody seen the movie? Several of you have. If not, it's okay. I'll explain it. It's, it was done by the Sherwood Pictures folks over in Albany, and I was down there doing a Bible study. I was just doing a Bible study for the crew, and after it was over, I was about to leave and go back to Birmingham. And as I was walking out, I'll never forget, the, Michael Catt, who was the pastor and the executive producer, he, he's yelled from across the room. He said, hey, Scott, do you want to be in this movie? And I acted just like every one of you. I was like, yes, sir. <laughs> you know, a star is born, you know. Uh, this is going to be my big, 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 you know, chance. And so I went through wardrobe, and it was nine hours of filming. It was the most intense scene. It was when they rushed into the room to arrest the bad officer, and it was during filming they realized that uh, uniformed officers would never arrest another uniformed officer, so they had to have officer of internal affairs 
that meant someone had to be in the suit. And I promise you, the reason why I got the part, the only reason I got the part was I was the only one who could fit in the suit. So that's how, yeah. Anyway, so they, they invited us to the premiere because we were a part of the film. And I, they gave me an entire row at Fox Theater up in Atlanta. It was, it was real. And I knew when the scene was going to happen because it was the critical time. And I was like, hey, here it comes. Here, here, here it comes. And if you've seen the movie, it's, I, I'm, you, you get this. You don't see me in the scene. I, all you can see is the back of my head. That's the only thing you can see. And I remember everybody was fixed on the screen. It was a very intense time. And I looked down the row, and one of my dearest friends in the world, Jordy Henson, he was bent over laughing hysterically. I mean, he was just busting a gut. And, and he looked down the row at me, and he just kind of said, Scott, you're not in this movie. I don't know why we're here. And here's the phrase he said. He said, all you are <laughs> is a glorified extra. And that phrase just stuck with me. And I realized, you, you know what my biggest problem in life is? It's not you. You know what your biggest problem in life is? I'm just to be straight up with you. It's not them. My biggest problem is me. And sometimes your biggest problem is you. Because my flesh will still be the leading man. We got to realize when Jesus comes on the scene and he infects us, all of a sudden, I step aside. He's the leading man. And all we are is a glorified extra in this thing called life. So the first mark is going to be godliness or being spiritual. The second mark is going to be that of humility. We're going to live our lives under God's authority. We're not going to be complicit. We're going to be obedient. The third mark that's going to be in our life is down in verse 9, and I call it the mark of persistence. The mark of persistence is found when Paul is identifying the law of sowing and reaping. Whatever you sow, that's what you're going to reap. You ask any farmer, if you plant tomatoes, don't expect to get corn. So he's explaining that law, and at the end of it, listen to what he says in verse 9. He says, and let us not grow weary of doing good. There's one message I could tell you in 2020, for the last 14 months leading up to today, is a lot of us have just gotten to the point where we've become weary. We've become isolated. We've, we've become like, man, I, there, it's, it's almost like I call it decision fatigue for leaders because as soon as you make a decision, you've got to alter it and you gotta, you're going to make half the people mad and you can't make everyone happy. So Paul says, even during these tough times, let us not grow weary while doing good for in due season we shall reap, and I love this last phrase, if we do not give up. And I don't know who I'm talking to right now. It's a great crowd. I know we have a great online audience. I, I, I don't know if it's a, a husband, a, a, a wife, a mom, a dad, son, daughter, friend. But my message is don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up on your family. Don't give up on your marriage. Don't give up on your kids. Don't give up on your parents. Don't give up on your neighbors. Don't give up on your city. Don't give up on your state. Let's not give up on our country. And certainly, we're not going to give up in this world. And I know you get to the point where you just want to go, what else can go on? And I understand there's been things that are thrown at us. And for the last 14 months, we've all experienced loss. loss most of us have experienced a loss of life in our, in, our, in our lives. We've lost someone that we love and we cherish. But every one of us has lost experiences. We've lost time. We've lost community. And I think we better start asking ourselves this question. And, and, and I don't want you to answer it out loud. I just want you to think about it because... They tell us, Barna's latest research says 30% of our church roles pre-pandemic are gone. They're not coming back. Now, we're seeing an influx of new people because they walked through a pandemic, and, and they're like, where can I find hope? Where can I find peace? You know, you can live days without food, but you can't live one moment without hope. So they're trying to figure out, where can I find hope? But 30% have left. They're not coming back. So I think we better ask ourselves this question. I'm going to ask him to bring it up on the screen. Listen to what he says. What would make you turn your back on Jesus? What, what would have to take place for you to cash it in and say, that's it, I'm out of here, see you later? Maybe something in your family, maybe something financially, maybe something experiential. I hope your answer is nothing. Because I can't stand up here this morning and tell you that something's not going to take place in your life. 
Now, do you remember earlier we were talking about the Garden of Eden? Do you know what happened in the Garden of Eden still impacts our life today? The Bible says creation moans because of the fall. And because we live in a fallen creation, I know we're godly. I know we're pursuing Christ, but we're still part of a fallen creation. So stuff happens. I'm not standing up here saying that if you've gone through cancer or you've had a tough 14 months or something's happened at you, God's, God's not mad at you. God's not lost control. I'm just telling you, because we live in a fallen creation, stuff happens, but it doesn't put a condition in our relationship with the living God. We didn't meet him in some conference room to negotiate our salvation, to say, hey, I'll give you my life, but just don't touch this area. You see, because things happen, We just keep going forward. And if that sounds weird, let me just go ahead and address it. There's only been one perfect person on this planet, Jesus. If anyone should have gotten out of here without any problems, it should have been Jesus. But you know what the Bible calls him? A man of sorrow acquainted with grief. And if you're sitting there going, Scott, you don't know what all's going on in these last 14 months, I think I need to remind us who's writing this verse. I think I need to remind us that when Paul says, we shall reap if we do not give up, if anyone should have given up, it probably should have been the Apostle Paul. Everywhere he went, people were trying to kill him. He just wanted to tell people about Jesus. He'd go into a city, tell people about Jesus. they say, Paul, if you don't be quiet, we're going to stone you. And I'm not talking about, you know, I'm talking about rocks, okay? You're sitting there going, well, at least he was comforted. Okay, no. I mean, there were rocks being thrown at him. Somebody says, well, Paul, if you don't be quiet, we're going to throw you in prison. And Paul says, well, throw me down there in Rome. There's a lot of prisoners down there. They need Jesus. And finally, somebody would say, Paul, if you don't be quiet, we're going to kill you. And Paul says, all right, go ahead. You see, I've already written these verses to live as Christ, but to die is to be absent from the body is to be present with. Paul says, you don't understand. I've already crossed the line. Doesn't matter what you do to me, I've only got one ambition in life, and that is to keep going forward. And listen to me, my dear brother or sister in Christ, if you are weary, if you're in this room and you almost want to just cash it in and say, that's it, it's over, don't give up. Keep going. It's going to be the mark in our lives. We're just going to have to walk through it and keep going. There is no other option. Because there's going to be the mark of persistence. Now, how do we get the mark of persistence? You see, we're building it. We have salvation, and then we have humility, and then we have persistence. Let me give you the final mark, and then we're done. It's the mark of passion. Now, passion. When I talk about passion, I'm not talking about a personality, okay? I'm a little hyper. I'm sorry. I've just always been hyper. I used to think the people who are more gregarious, more extroverted, they were the passionate ones. No. We just drink too much caffeine, amen? I mean, that's how I am. I'm just always drinking coffee. And so it's not about a personality. Forgive me if I scare you with all my, uh, you know, energy. It's just built in. I can't help it. But if passion is not your personality, I'll say this. It's easy for us to fake it better if I'm gregarious, if I'm extroverted. So I got to check that in my system. But you know what passion is? Passion is my priority. Passion is what I think about. Passion is what I spend my money on. Passion is what I'm focused on. I'm just going to tell you, the, uh, the old illustration about college football, I, I, I think we slam college football so much about they worship their sport. Uh, it does amaze me that grown men will paint their bodies to show up and root for some guys. So I, I'm not going to but I'm going to tell you, college football is the greatest sport ever created. It's a lousy God, but it's a great sport. But I'm talking about whatever you focus on. It could be shopping. It could be your hobbies. It could be your organization. that you. What I'm just asking you, your passion is your priority. I want you to see Paul's priority in Galatians 6, verse 14. I'm going to be reading this from the New Living Translation, so don't get mad. But I want you to see it in a different light, okay? I, 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 honestly, I'd always kind of put it in New King James Version. And, but when I started reading the different versions, when I hit New Living Translation, listen to how Paul puts this. As for me, may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'll talk to you about a lot of stuff but I'm going to focus on the cross. Because of that cross, love that phrase, because of that cross, my interest in this world has been crucified, and the world's interest in me has also died. 
It's when I get passionate about the gospel of Jesus, I realize my focus is on the eternity. My focus is on peace and hope and love, and it's not being socially acceptable. I, in fact, I'm just going to tell you, I've resigned from this universe. I just resigned because what was wrong is now right, and what is right is now wrong, and we're more concerned about what people say about us on social media than what our family thinks of us, and I'm just done with it because, because of that cross. If we can fixate our lives on the cross and what Jesus did for us, the things of this world just simply start to fade away. But most of us are inside this room, and, and we've got a problem. We've got to disconnect. And the way I want to explain it to you is um, by an illustration about my life. A couple of years ago, in fact, when I was here two times ago, I was running for office. I was running for governor of the state of Alabama. Now, I know you probably didn't know that. I'll be honest with you. A lot of people in Alabama didn't know I was running for governor. That's the reason I lost. But anyway, that's, that's another story. I'm, I'm not bitter. Anyway, uh, but I'm uh, <laughs> no, just kidding. Anyway, as I was running, I love campaigning. I mean, I love, man, no one is going to outwork me. I, I love, because of that gregarious, extroverted attitude, when I get in a group of people, I'm going to be in front of them. And so what we found was doing straw polls. Now, straw polls in the political system is when you show up to a, to a gathering and, and you, they have the candidates all give their spiel, their speech, three to five minutes usually, and then at the end of it, they cast their votes, the people who are present. And whoever gets the most vote wins the straw poll. What I found during campaigning is I won every straw poll besides one. I came in second on that one, but every straw poll I won. But I got slaughtered in the primary. And I was like, whoa, what's going on here? I, I, I win the room, but I lose the election. And I'm not really, this is not scientific. I'm still walking through this, trying to figure it all out. But here's my theory. When they were in the room with me, I was giving them vision. I was giving them, hey, this guy's not a politician. This is a different way of looking at it. This sounds really good to me. I'm going to vote for him. But when they walked out of the room, here's the difference. I had $400,000 to spend on television commercials. My opponent had $4.7 million to spend on commercials. So what happened was when they walked out of the room and they got home and they saw commercial after commercial after commercial, it started messing, and their mind went, you know what, I like him, but he can't win. I, I like him, but this can't happen. You, you see, I, I had their heart. I didn't get their mind. You go, well, what does that mean to us in this church service? We're not running for office. I'll say this. The church will never compete against the world because we have a different product. And if you're not careful, you'll be inside this room right now, and, and your heart will be one. You'll be sitting there, and you'll go, man, Jesus, because of that cross, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, persistence, move on. You go, I got, I got that. And your heart's been captured, but when you walk out of here, if you're not careful, you're going to be inundated with the cultural communication of it can't happen in your life. This is not going to happen for you. And all of a sudden, you're going to start cashing in the chips, going, man, it must be for somebody else, because it's not for me. You see, your heart's been won, but in order for you to walk out of here being effective followers of Christ, your mind has got to be captured. How does your mind get captured? What well, Paul says in Galatians 6.14, because of that cross. you got to fixate your mind on what Jesus has done for you. And it can happen in anybody's life. If it, Jesus changed my life, I know he can change yours. And I'm going to ask the instrumentalist to come, and she's going to begin to play very softly. And as that is happening, I, I just want to talk to you real quick as we go into the time of invitation. Because I know I'm speaking to a vast crowd, both here and online, and I don't know what's going on inside this room. In fact, we used to say that there was, a, there was a, something called the psychic network. You know, there were a bunch of psychics, and they were on tele, late at night, infomercials. They'd be the psychic network. I don't know if you know the end result of that. They went bankrupt. I think to myself, if they were psychics, wouldn't they have seen that coming? But anyway, that's a different story. 
So I, I just, I'm not a psychic. I don't know what's going on in this room. I don't know what's happening in your life. But Jesus does. And I don't want to be a spiritual travel agent. Because a travel agent, you know what they do. They send you maps and say, have fun. I'd much rather be a spiritual tour guide. Because a tour guide will go with you. Now, a tour guide cannot experience it for you. But they can be right there beside you. I, that's what I would love to be because I, I, I know inside this room you may be sitting there going, how can this God become real in my life? I'm tired of Jesus being the God of multiple choice. If I'm, if, I'm, if I'm pressed and I have to pick one, I guess I'll pick him. But he's never changed your life. You don't have a relationship with him. All he is is a religious figure. How does he become real? There's one word. It's called surrender. In fact, I love what Paul says in Romans 10, 13. He says, whosoever. He starts off with whosoever. I love that because I'm part of whosoever. If you're not careful, you'll be sitting here thinking it's for everyone else but you. But Paul says whosoever. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, the word call means to stretch forth. A lot of us have got it in our mind that it's a parent and child. You know, the child lifting up. And that's part of it. But Paul is writing with urgency. A couple of weeks ago, I was down in Panama City and I found out through the news that over 200 people that week alone had been rescued from the riptide. And so my mind picture for you for the word call is if you're in the Gulf and you're out there and you get caught up in that riptide and you're struggling, man. You're going up, you're going down, going up, going down. And right before you go under the last time, a life preserver hits the top of the, uh, of the water. You know what you're going to You're going to grab the life preserver because you need to be saved. Now, you could be sitting here saying, wait a minute, Scott, that means I saved myself. No, nope, you're drowning. You can't save yourself. You have to trust the life preserver. Now, here's where you got to understand, I'm not the life preserver. As much as I love Cascade Hills, I'm not the life preserver. God just uses these resources to throw the life preserver your way. We're talking about Jesus. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I don't know any better way to call upon the name of the Lord than by prayer. And I know some of you are out there going, wait a minute, there's not a prayer that's written in Scripture that I'm supposed to pray. That's not there. And, and I'll agree with you. Look, I'll agree with you. There's not a prayer written in Scripture that you have to pray verbatim to receive Christ. But let me also remind you, throughout Scripture, it teaches about prayer. In fact, Isaiah says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord's not going to hear me. I got news for you. We've already raised our hands. That means we got a problem. If we've sinned, God's not going to hear our prayer, according to Isaiah. But you go to the New Testament, Paul says, pray without ceasing. So how do you go from God not hearing your prayer to God always hearing your prayer? You go to Jesus. That's where you got to go, because Jesus told a religious person, Nicodemus, he said, Nicodemus, if you want to know how a man is born again, you must, you must be born again. How are you born again? You call upon the name of the Lord. So today, wherever you are, in whatever situation you're in, you're saying, well, you don't know how messed up I am. You know what I love about catching fish? I've never caught a clean fish. I always have to clean them after I get them. So God, God right now is going, I know, you're, you're, I know your mess. I know your circumstance. He's meeting you right where you are. But he's going to meet you where you are, and he's going to bring you to where you need to be. So Today, wherever you are across this room, if you're sitting there, if you're watching this and you're going, I need Jesus. I need something that's real. I don't say how you serve. Life is tough with Jesus. Amen? It's unbearable without him. So wherever you are, if you're in this room and you want something real in your life, I'm going to invite you to pray this prayer. I can't do it for you. If you're just going to recite these words, it doesn't happen. You've got to talk to God. He wants a relationship with you. So if we all do this, none of us are going to think we're weird. But would you just bow your head with me? Okay, so every head's bowed, every eye's closed. And this morning, right where you are, as I pray this prayer out loud, would you just pray this prayer in your heart? Don't say one word with your lips. You pray it in your heart. The person beside you doesn't know what's going on, but the Bible says there's rejoicing in the presence of God. That means if you pray this prayer, they're throwing a party in heaven on your behalf right now. So I'm going to pray it out loud. You pray it right there in your heart. It goes like this. Dear God, I know I've done some things wrong, but I know you love me to the point that you sent your son to die on the cross for me. So right now, the best way I know how, I receive you into my life. 
Forgive me of my sin. Make me brand new. I know you love me. Help me to love you. Thank you, God. I now call you Father. Thank you. So with heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if you just prayed that prayer this morning for the first time, or let's be straight up, first time you ever meant it. You weren't doing it because you felt like somebody wanted you to do it. You didn't feel like it was a ritual. This morning, as best as you knew how, you crossed the line. You surrendered. You prayed to receive Christ in your life. Could I ask you, if you did that without any pressure, no one's going to come after you. No spotlight's going to be on you. But if you prayed that prayer with me this morning, would you very gently and silently just lift your face and look right up here at me? I promise you, I'm not going to leave. I can't see you because of the lights anyway. The reason why I have you looking at me is because I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm about to share. Because I want you to realize today is not the end. Today is the beginning. The beginning of a new relationship. And so God's not the one that wants to come in and play games with you. He's the God that wants to plant roots in your life. And it really doesn't matter what Scott Dawson says. It matters what Jesus says. And can I just remind you this morning what Jesus says in his word? Because at this point, it hadn't cost you anything. You've lifted your faith. It cost Jesus his life. And if you really want to think about something, Jesus loved you so much he'd rather die than to live without you. But if all he did was die, I'd say that's a good man. But I'd probably stop right there. But on the third day, he resurrected. Do you know no one's ever died to resurrect and never die again? Therefore, Jesus is the only one who can give salvation. And he's chosen you this morning. So I, I want you to hear what he says on it. He puts a condition upon salvation. He says, if you deny me before men, I'm going to deny you before my Father. If you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. See, some of you have been brought to this point in your life before. You've been interested in Jesus. You've been intrigued by him. But you never crossed the line. He's kind of warmed your heart, but he's never infected your life. So in just a few moments, I'm going to tell you what's going to go on. We're going to pray, and then after we pray, we're going to stand. As soon as we stand, Clint and the praise team, they're going to begin to sing. And as soon as they sing, what I'm going to ask you to do, as soon as your knees become straight, I'm going to ask you to leave your seat. If you're on the end, you step out. If you're in the middle, you scoot out. You come forward. There's some men and women down here at the front. I want you to grab their hand and simply say, I prayed to receive Jesus. You're saying, whoa, you're adding something to it. I'm not adding anything to it. I'm just telling you this. If you're not willing to tell a bunch of Jesus followers that you're, you're, you've received Christ, do you really believe you're going to be able to go back home, go back to your business and live for him in a world that hates him? I, I just don't want you to walk out, out of here with a half-truth. And by the way, you may be the only one that comes. I'd rather that be your mentality and you come to Jesus than for you to sit back, wait on everyone else to make their decision, and then you're not following Jesus. You're just following his followers. Jesus never says, follow my followers. Jesus says, follow me. So this morning, this has to be your decision. As soon as we stand, if you can't come by yourself, grab a friend's hand. They'll come with you. Just come this morning and say, I pray. No embarrassment. They're not going to pray you around. They're going to give you some information and make sure you know what's going on in your life. There's not many people who give a rip about anything. Don't run from the people who care about you today. So I'm going to ask heads are bowed, eyes are closed, because I also understand inside this room, it's been a brutal 14 months. There are some people inside this room that have battled depression and discouragement. Some have probably thought about doing some things that that are permanent solutions for, for temporary situations. I'm just going to ask you, would you please come to Jesus this morning? Would you just come? Hey, there's some people who want to pray with you and talk with you. Some of you are here this morning. You're saved, but you've almost just given up. Man, get, 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 get your focus back in alignment. Let your audio start syncing up with your video. Come to Jesus this morning. Altar's open. People want to help you. This is your decision. We're going to pray, and then we're going to stand. You're going to come to Christ this morning. Father, we thank you for what you're doing across this room and online. God, I pray for every person that just received you into their life. Would you give them boldness and guts like they've never known before to make sure somebody knows what's going on inside their life. We don't have to tell everyone necessarily. We've got to tell someone. Father, I pray right now you'll draw us into your presence. I pray that you show up and you show off for your glory. We'll give you the praise and honor for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. You come to Jesus right now. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Are you saved? Be upon you and a thousand generations to family, your children and their children and their children.
looking up here and I love the celebration and if you're wondering we celebrate we celebrate because this is this is life but I know some of you are out there going man what type of speaker do we have is he one of those old-fashioned long invitation people yes sir I am we're not gonna be much longer because I know we're busy but I'm gonna tell you what we've gone through the last 14 months it's been brutal I just love having community. I think we've learned, you know, it's more, it's, it's important to have someone in your life. And so this morning, I'm going to ask you to do something. And if you're going to get mad at someone, don't get mad at Pastor Clint. Don't get mad at Pastor Brent. Get mad at Scott Dawson because I'm the one leading this service. They didn't know I was going to do this. And to be honest with you, I don't live here. And, you know, I've already lost the election, so it really doesn't matter. So y'all, y'all don't get mad at me. You won't. But I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you, in just a few moments, I'm going to count to three. So not right now. I'm going to give you some time. I'm going to count to three. When I count to three, someone's going to lean over to you, everyone here, beside you, in front of you, behind you, and just simply say, if you'd like to go forward, I'll go with you. Now, I know there's some of you like, man, nobody better ask me if I want to go forward. I'm going to be upset. Don't get mad at them. In in fact, I'm going to be straight up. If you're going to get mad because someone cares about you, be my guest. Get mad at me. Because life is too short, Jesus is too real, and eternity is too long for us to play games with this. So real friends bring friends to Jesus. And it's about time we understand the invitation is not about a job interview. Because if we were in this room trying to get a job, I would be competing against you because I'm competitive. I play a senior adult at checkers. I want to whip her, okay? I'm just, I'm just sorry. I'm about, but we're, we're not in competition. If you really want to know what this is, this is a waiting room. For some souls who are weary and tired and sick and the great physicians calling our name it's time to keep that appointment and so in just a few moments when someone leans over and says if you'd like to go forward I'll go with you I just want you to put it in perspective in three ways number one God's brought us here you didn't know I was gonna be here I didn't know you were gonna be here God does all this number two God's speaking and I'm not saying through Scott some of you let's be honest God's been speaking to you for months to get you in this place to get you at this point. In fact, they tell us, the average person, I say, come on. The average person has to hear the gospel seven times before they respond according to all the theories that are out there. This is for some of you, your seventh time for you to respond this morning. And when they lean over, I want you to just put it in perspective the third way. When was the last time someone cared enough to get in your space? For 14 months, we've been like six feet apart. And someone's about to lean over and say, I'll be your friend. I'll go with you. And by the way, it's for salvation, but it's for so much more. Some of us this morning, we're here and we know we're saved. But man, it's been brutal. And I'm talking about depression. I'm talking about the thoughts of suicide. I'm talking about the addiction that you've never dealt with. I'm talking about the marriage that's falling apart. I'm talking about the family that on the outside, everything looks good, but when the doors are shut, there's so much turmoil and conflict. You're one step from being set free. And by the way, I'm gonna tell you this, I can't help you. You're not coming to me, you're not coming to them. You're coming to Jesus, the great physician who says, I wanna heal. I wanna start working. I wanna start mending. I wanna start doing a miracle in your home. And you know what? Some of you right now are going, in my heart, I want that. But your mind right now is going, it can't happen. I'm telling you, don't let the evil one rob you of this moment. I'm going to count to three. Someone's going to ask you, and you are one step from being set free. Here we go. One, two, three. I'll go with you. I'll go with you. I'll go with you. I'll go with you.
Hey, thank you for visiting us today. And if this ministry has touched your life in any way, please send us your story to I am at CascadeHills.com. And if you'd like to help support this ministry financially and help us spread the word of Jesus Christ around the world, you can go to CascadeHills.com or our Cascade Hills app and select the Give button. We hope you enjoyed the services today. Tune in next week for another great message.